Welcome to today's Energy Symposium. Uh, I am your host for today again, Carrie King of the Energy Institute, uh, research scientist and assistant director. Uh, next week's talk will be from Salim Ali, who is a uh, professor of energy and the environment at the University of Delaware. His title is going to be about critical materials and energy supplies, so it is elements of energy and considering the role of critical material. So if we want to think about the roles of materials and different widgets and gadgets that consume, produce, transform, or convert energy into one form or another, then uh, tomorrow is your talk. So he should be a great speaker because he thinks about the policy and environmental aspects, uh, geopolitics of getting uh, resources from around the world for different uh, energy, uh, energy needs and for other needs. Uh, so today, uh, it is, uh, we have a, a very nice talk. It's a pleasure to introduce Asher Price uh, to give our talk for today. He is a journalist at the Austin American State Statesman, so he's our local reporter, and he covers energy and environmental issues, and he has done so for several years. He has a few books out on the topic. One is about uh, the history of the wind industry uh, with some thoughts on Texas, uh, and you can see his uh, we, he has a recent book that just came out, uh, which is not about energy, which is about Earl Campbell. So Earl Campbell and the desegregation or segregation of Texas. Uh, and so that just recently came out. So congratulations, Asher, on that book. Uh, and today he is going to speak uh, about his ongoing book project, which he is why he is our uh, University of Texas uh, Energy uh, Journalism Fellow for this semester. Uh, in which he's able to take time off and work on this book. So, so you're, you're seeing a work in progress on his thoughts on, for fighting over Eden, energy, environment, and religion in modern America. I don't know how much that's the fixed title of his book. Uh, maybe you can give him some so thoughts on that. So uh, today's non-technical talk, but it should be very entertaining. So uh, Asher, thank you very much, uh, and let's welcome him here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that nice introduction, Kerry. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure, I'm, as, as Kerry mentioned, I'm a, a journalism fellow at the Energy Institute. And when someone says it's an entertaining talk, I feel like I should be juggling or something, you know, on a unicycle. Um, and uh, as a journalist, I'm much more accustomed to asking questions than speaking to an audience. So apologies if I'm at all anxious or nervous. Um, there's a quick joke I'll tell that's um, in keeping, actually, with, in a way, with the, the topic here, which is that um, there's a young rabbi at a synagogue, and he's told by the older rabbi that this Saturday he's going to give the sermon. And the young rabbi is very nervous, and he asks the older rabbi for any advice. And the older rabbi says, you know, instead of bringing up a glass of water, you can bring a martini up just to cut the edge. So Saturday rolls around. The young rabbi leads the service. He gives the sermon. Afterwards, the congregants file out, and he rushes to the back of the synagogue to ask the older rabbi how to go. And the older rabbi says, well, I have, I have two pieces of advice for next time. First of all, just because you bring a martini up there doesn't mean you need to put olives in it. Um, and the other piece of advice is next year, when you're giving the same sermon about David and Goliath, just remember that David smote Goliath. He didn't beat the crap out of him. Um, so anyway... I, I, um, I, I'm not an engineer. Um, I know very little about religion. Um, I'm, I know something about energy only insofar as I've written about energy and environmental issues for the Austin American Statesman. And a lot of my job there is to kind of draw dots between power and money and politics. Um, so I say that all to say that in a way I'm a weird fit for this topic, which is about the intersection of energy and religion. Um, so let's see, wrong computer, here we go. So here are some people um, hearing a great preacher, and who might that preacher be but um, Rick Perry, um, our recent governor, and now our Secretary of Energy. And this is in 2011. Um, this is at NRG Stadium. Um, and this is shortly after um, Governor Perry had called for three days of prayer um, uh, to ask God for rain. Um, he, had, he issued this proclamation. Um, this was in, in spring of 2011. There was a big drought, sorry, at the time, I should say. Um, 
And uh, he said, uh, his proclamation said, whereas throughout our history, both as a state and as in individuals, Texans have been strengthened, assured, and lifted up through prayer, it seems right and fitting that the people of Texas should join together in prayer to humbly seek an end to this devastating drought in these dangerous wildflowers, uh, wildfire, sorry. Um, you know, during these official three days of prayer, I urge Texans of all faiths and traditions uh, to offer prayers on those days for the healing of our land, the rebuilding of our communities, and the restoration of our normal way of life. I just wanted to bring that up at the beginning of this talk to show an example of how religion bleeds into um, public life, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis energy and environmental issues. I mean, it's no surprise that, you know, here in America in the year 2019, um, religion plays a role in politics, um, but I'm especially interested in how it plays a role in energy and environmental policy, uh, which I think hasn't been, you know, looked at that closely. Um, here's a protester in front of the Capitol after those three days of rain, you know, he has his own point of view. Um, so a little bit about what I thought I'd talk about today. Um, um, one thing is these kind of two competing strains of thought about um, energy and the environment within religious circles. And roughly speaking, I think of these as the stewards versus the dominionists. If you think about you know, creation, are we supposed to take care of it or are we supposed to exploit the resources that God put here? Um, uh, I'm also interested in in what I find a kind of disquieting um, relationship between politicians, both on the left and the right, on, um, is a reach for kind of religious-minded votes. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, briefly about skepticism of the causes of climate change uh, and reawakening of the religious right. And, uh, but first, I just wanted to talk briefly about how I got interested in in this topic, which is a little bit of a, again, it's kind of like a weird mishmash talking about religion and energy. Um, it may not be useful to you, actually. Um, I think it's, there's, there are interesting things to say about it, but, you know, it's up to you and your own creative lives as students to figure out how or if it applies to your, um, to the work you do. So the guy on the left, uh, on the photograph left here is a guy named Victor Creo, um, who's at the time of this photograph is chief executive of something called Zion Oil and Gas in Dallas. And um, he became a board member of, uh, he's a trained geologist. He became a board member, he became CEO, he became a board member of, of Zion while he was chairman of the State Texas Railroad Commission. Anybody here know what the State Railroad Commission regulates? gentleman in the green shirt. That's right. So he was the state oil and gas regulator and also serving an unpaid position, board position, uh, for one of the companies he regulates, which is permissible in the state of Texas. Um, but that got me as a reporter interested in what this company did. And actually, shortly after he left the state uh, oil and gas agency, the Railroad Commission, um, he became a paid board member of this company gets paid 450 grand a year, I think. Um, um, and when I say he left the railroad commission, he wasn't reelected. Um, so I interviewed him. So Zion Oil and Gas, its stated mission is to basically through drilling of oil is to hasten the second coming. Um, and I interviewed uh, Mr. Creo about this, and he described his job description to me as bringing the theology that informs the geology, um, which I thought was a great way to put it. Um, you know, uh, it has a kind of ring to it. So he talked to me about his theory of drilling. Um, so I was going to say a little bit more about its mission. Let's see. Um, right, its, its ultimate purpose is to hasten the second coming. They cite, uh, you know, Genesis and Deuteronomy about uh, biblical promises of treasure buried deep. And uh, this is bits from my interview with Victor Carrillo. He said, we make our plans for how and where to drill, but ultimately the outcome is in God's hands. 
Can we guarantee success? Absolutely not, but there's a good likelihood everything will come together on a biblical basis. It is weird. It's very weird. And by the way, they, they get lots of people to invest in their company. Through, and, and this actually, this kind of um, wibbly-wobbly rhetoric about can we guarantee success? Not. I mean, to me, it, it has certain echoes in our, our own president's speech, actually, about not necessarily being, you know, about leaving things open a little bit. Um, so my role, he writes, is to help the company, he said to me, is to help the company find where do we punch the specific holes in the ground to find, in the biblical language, the treasures of the deep. Um, and quite weirdly, um, they were in, inspired to drill um, in the northwest of Israel, um, near the territory of the ancient tribe of Asher. This is a map of Israel. My name's Asher, by the way. Um, I'm Jewish. Um, so in the upper left, you know, the northwest part is the tribe of Asher. So this is an, this is an ancient, this purports to be an ancient tribal map of Asher, uh, of Israel, right? Divvied up by the tribes of, of Israel. And there's a line in the Bible. This is, this is how Zion works. Okay, I'm just explaining. This is how Zion works. Um, there's, a, there's a line in the Bible about the blessing bestowed upon the tribe of Asher, of, of Asher and the tribe of Asher. Asher is one of the 12 sons of Joseph. Twelve sons of Jacob or of Joseph? I can't remember anymore. Anyway, that's not a very good practicing Jew. Um, this is the line. Most blessed, be, most blessed of sons be Asher. Let him be the favorite of his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Let him dip his foot in oil. That suggests that we ought to drill in southern Asher. His foot. Let him dip his foot in oil. So... Um, that's where they started drilling. This is the way they divined clues about where to drill based on, uh, uh, on, on religious liturgy. Suffice it to say, they're under investigation by the SEC now. Um, Carrillo has actually left the company. He stepped down last year. Um, uh, and the SEC is investigating them for fraud. Okay. Um, but this was, to me, a kind of illustrative example about people in power in state politics whose work um, in, somebody here said the word weird, in a weird way dovetails with uh, this kind of religious thinking on energy issues. He's not alone. Um, this is the book, If Jesus Were an Investment Banker, uh, or any other type of modern businessman, and this is by, uh, written by Barry Smitherman, who served as the chair of our Public Utility Commission um, shortly after he wrote this book. And then he also was a chairman of the State Railroad Commission, the Oil and Gas Energy Regulatory Agency. Now, people can do whatever they want in terms of prayer on their own time, obviously. Um, but um, and I, I think some of the further examples I'll show you suggest that people people in power start bringing um, kind of their religious thought into how they think about contemporary scientific issues. Um, so in my, I, I mentioned that I'm Jewish. Um, here's a Hanukkah lamp. People here know the story of Hanukkah? The story of Hanukkah is basically that uh, it's one of the festivals Jews celebrate, and it commemorates the... Um, this guerrilla army called the Maccabees overcoming a uh, kind of Syrian Greek uh, empire which had taken over Israel. And uh, the miracle that's celebrated is not just that, but also that the oil that's meant to re-sanctify the ancient temple that the Maccabees liberated looked like it would last only one night, but it in fact, or at least the story is, it lasted eight nights. So that's the, the miracle of Hanukkah. And to me, um, growing up, it seemed to me really an energy story. Um, and you see these sorts of energy stories kind of littered throughout the Bible. This is um, a Renaissance painting of, it's a really kind of trippy painting of, this is Moses twice. These are two different stories in the same painting involving Moses. But this is Moses in the burning bush. You know, the bush was not consumed. God appeared to Moses as a burning bush 
and the bush, but the bush didn't, you know, didn't turn to ash. That was this, so that's also in a strange way um, an energy story. It seems like a lot of um, stories that our forebears would tell about divine manifestation um, kind of come through in, in, in stories about energy. Of course, here's the Garden of Eden. Um, and there's Adam and Eve. And, um, you know, I think, going back to what I was saying originally, you can look at a, it, the, you can think about the story of Eden as one of stewardship or one of dominion. Um, and actually, I handed out this reading, and I wondered if anybody has the courage to stand up and, and read this out loud. This is Milton, the person in the pink uh, top there. Oh, yes, sorry, you have to use the mic. Have, um... What's your name? Me? Yes. Ashton. Ashton. Yes. That's so great. I'm Asher. Hi. So why don't you read this? This is from Paradise Lost. This is Adam essentially lecturing Eve about, you know, not to pluck the apple, right? Um, okay, is it on? Okay. So just read it through. Go for it. So, John Milton, Paradise Lost, book four, uh, page, or lines 417 through 430. That's right. Okay, so Adam speaking to Eve. He requires from us no other service than to keep this one, this easy charge, of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruit, so various, not to taste that only tree of knowledge, planted by the tree of life. Samir grows death to life. Wherever death is, some dreadful thing, no doubt. For thou knowest, God has pronounced it death to taste that tree, the only sign of our obedience left. And among so many signs of power and rule, confer upon us the dominion given over all creatures that possess earth, air, and sea. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. I love the part where he says, death is a terrible thing, whatever death is, because, you know, th at that point they're virginal, as it were. They, they, don't, they don't know about the, these terrible miseries. Um, uh, by the way, if you haven't read Paradise Lost, I recommend it. I took a college class in it. It was terrific. Um, uh, but I, anyway, as you can tell, the reason I bring this up is Milton's line about dominion given to us. This is one of the strains of thought, is that we have dominion over all other creatures that possess earth, air, and sea. And I wanted to um, kind of contrast that with another strain of thought, which is John Muir, the great conservationist, naturalist. Here's Muir doing some kind of educational thing. This is in the early 20th century. He was a native Scotsman who moved with his family, I think as a kid or as a teenager, to Wisconsin. And he grew up Presbyterian in quite a religious household. Um, but he was very skeptical of this dominion, dominionist kind of view. Um, and um, I asked Jenny to read a passage. I'm going to pull it up on the screen here if I can. Let's see. So this is John Muir. This is from, he, this is from a memoir he wrote called A Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf, where is a 29-year-old. He walked from Kentucky to the, to the, to the Florida coast. Um, so Jenny, would you mind reading this passage? The world, we are told, was made especially for man, a presumption not supported by all the facts. A numerous class of men are painfully astonished whenever they find anything, living or dead, in all God's universe, which they cannot eat or render in some way that they call useful to themselves. They have precise dogmatic insights of the intentions of the Creator, and it is hardly possible to be guilty of irreverence in speaking of their God any more than of heathen idols. He is regarded as a civilized, law-abiding gentleman in favor either of a republican form of government or of a limited monarchy. Believes in the literature and language of England, is a warm supporter of the English Constitution and Sunday schools and missionary societies, and is as purely a manufactured article as any puppet of a halfpenny theater. With such views of the creator, it is, of course, not surprising that erroneous views should be entertained of the creation. To such properly trimmed people, the sheep, for example, is an easy problem. 
food and clothing for us, eating grass and daisies by divine appointment for this predestined purpose, on perceiving the demand for wool that would be occasioned by eating of the apple in the Garden of Eden. In the same pleasant plan, whales are store ho- storehouses of oil for us to help out the stars in lighting our dark ways until the discovery of the Pennsylvania oil wells. Among plants, hemp, to say nothing of the cereals, is a vase of evident destination for ships rigging, wrapping packages, and hanging the wicked. Cotton is another plain case of clothing. Iron was made for hammers and plows and lead for bullets, all intended for us. Now, it never seems to occur to these far-seeing teachers that nature's object in making animals and plants might possibly be, first of all, the happiness of each one of them, not the creation of all for the happiness of one. Why should man value himself as more than a small part of one great unit of creation? The universe would be incomplete without man, but would also be incomplete without the smallest transmicroscopic creature that dwells beyond our conceitful eyes and knowledge. Thank you very much. So you can tell it's a kind of playful, scathing uh, take on this dominionist point of view. Um, right. And I was especially interested, I'll, I'll go to the big screen in a minute, but in the same pleasant plan, whales are storehouses of oil for us to help out the stars in lighting our dark ways until the discovery of the Pennsylvania oil well. So that's his kind of utter, undercutting this idea. Um, now, here's Pete Buttigieg um, uh, grilling probably in Iowa. I think he's grilling in Iowa. He's on the campaign trail. And um, I wanted to show, so I think this tension that I've described between stewardship and dominion plays out now on the uh, in the halls of power on the campaign trail. And so I wanted to show a couple videos related to that. Um, I'm not going to make this big because I worry about getting out each time. So, so here's Mayor Pete talking to Stephen Colbert about this issue. Yes. You, last night in the, in, the, in the town hall on climate change, you called climate change a sin. Yeah. In what way is climate change a transgression of God's laws? Well, uh, in, look, I'm not out to impose my faith on anybody else, but the... Sharia the, law, is this your Sharia law? <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I'm, I'm Episcopalian. Um, and oh, you don't got, have Sharia law. You're our Sharia to tell law me. is called the Book of Common Prayer. Gotcha. Uh, okay. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about the environment. There's a lot of stuff about stewardship for creation. But also, to me, environmental stewardship isn't just about taking care of the planet, it's taking care of our neighbor. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. And the biggest problem with with climate change isn't just that it's going to hurt the planet. I mean, in some way, shape, or form, the planet's still going to be here. It's that we are hurting people, people who are alive right now and people who will be born in the future. The way I see it, I I don't imagine that God's going to let us off the hook for abusing future generations any more uh, than you would be off the hook for harming somebody right next to you. And with climate change, we're doing both. Um, uh, By the way, if anyone has any questions or wants to interrupt or anything, they should feel free. And I'm curious how you guys feel. I mean, I don't know if any of you are Mayor Pete, you know, um, supporters or not, but how do you feel about uh, hearing that kind of... um, take on, on, on climate change and sinfulness. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Yes, what's your name? Uh, my name's Ari. Um, I'm supposed to throw you a microphone. Uh, I, th- I, have to, like, I should have a javelin. Uh, yeah, my name's Ari. Um, I was just going to say, I feel like he's speaking in a language that a lot of other, or at least a lot of other people would be able to understand because I feel like that's kind of the problem sometimes with climate change is it becomes so polarized and right and left and all this that you kind of have to speak other people's languages and if he's framing it in this way of like hey it's a sin to be doing this to our planet and to our neighbors then it might it's probably a good thing because it, it helps other people understand um, the gravity behind it. If, if they're maybe not going to understand the science behind it, at least they're going to understand the, the moral gravity behind it. So. That sounds right to me. I mean, it's partly, uh, and I think maybe you're touching on this too, it's partly a, 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 almost a, apart from its earnestness, it may be politically a, a rhetorical move. If you f- talk about science, people might flip out. So you can talk Speaking about languages. the Bible. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm going to show another video along those lines. There's the, people here heard of Catherine Hayhoe? She's a Texas Tech professor who's also a practicing Christian who talks a lot about these issues. Um, here she is. This is, I think, a, just a brief thing I'm going to show you. You know that at the very beginning of the Bible, it talks about how humans have been given responsibility over every living thing on this earth, which includes our brothers and sisters who are less fortunate than us. Then all through the Bible, it talks about God's love and care for creation, for nature. And then it talks a lot about caring for others who are less fortunate than us, the poor, the widows, the orphans, sharing what we have with people in need. And then right at the end of the Bible, there is a zinger that very few people have read. And it specifically says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. That's the book of Revelation. So there's a lot that you can talk about. But in today's world... Don't go straight to Revelation, okay? <laughs> it's at the end. I'll, I'll pause it there. I, I think, I mean, there's a sort of steward, this sort of stewardship strain coming through with both um, Mayor Peep and with Catherine Hayhoe. Um, and, uh, and so I personally, I mean, I think, um, I think you're right that there's, there's, there might be sort of reasons to approach people in this, in this way on grounds that they're comfortable with. But I find that in itself disquieting, that you have someone running for president. I personally am, as you've gleaned, pretty a-religious. So I find it a little disquieting that, that um, a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate has to resort to um, that kind of language to so that everybody's clapping and like, oh, great, you know, this is, this guy, he's appealing. He's not going to talk about science. He's going to talk about uh, the common book of prayer. Um, so, and I also find it somewhat disquieting that, you know, that with Professor Hayhoe, that, um, that, that part of her appeal is this, um, is this, uh, is, is this argument on these religious terms. I mean, she also, by the way, she's a scientist. She argues on scientific terms as well. I, I, don't, I don't want to give that short shrift at all. Um, so let me go. Yes, please. You have to wait for a, a mic. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, but both of them are so attacked by evangelicals and other religious groups, they're trying to get over the hump to say, you know, we can talk a little of this language, too. And I think that's really what they're trying to do. It's not that they don't believe in the science, or the science is not the main uh, issue here or uh, fact. Uh, you know, I just think they're, I mean, uh, as a I gay totally person, uh, Buddha judge is getting killed. Uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, the Bibles, all these that's right. folks are on his tail all the time. And he's just trying to find some way to communicate in a way where he can reach out to others to try to tamp it down and see if they can find something in common. I totally agree with you. And I think both with Hayho and with, with him, he, he's, I'm sure he's been briefed on the science and so on and so forth. And, and, but I, I, I guess I should have been more precise in my comments. I find it disquieting that, 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 he ha that for political purposes he has to resort to that kind of rhetoric, that, that, the, that the conversation isn't just about, for, for the very reasons that you're saying he has to. I mean, uh, the, the, the argument isn't, on, isn't about charts showing rays of the sun coming, you know, and, and uh, greenhouse gas, uh, gases in the atmosphere. And fine, I mean, maybe, that, maybe one thing that makes him a breakthrough candidate is that he's comfortable in his skin talking about the religious aspects of this. Um, and maybe we shouldn't live in a kind of um, uh, a kind of technocratic world. And he's a politician who has to appeal to as many people as possible, right? I, I have no doubt that he, he has um, that he he comes to these opinions scientifically in a scientific way as well. Um, but um, I just I, I guess I'm saying, and this is no great revelation that in this day and age. Apparently, you have to make the religious um, argument as well. Yes. Thank you. What's Hi. Uh, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Yeah. Um, 
this is not really a question, more of just a comment, really. Um, I'm not surprised because I think historically the state and the church have been very intertwined um, and only in recent years have we become more secularized. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I think religion has always been a propeller of social change. Um, if you want to consider climate change a, a sort of a social movement, you could compare it to the civil rights movement or feminism. Religion has always been brought into these movements as a way to rally people and as a way to explain circumstances. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised to see these, these, uh, this kind of rhetoric. Thank you. That's actually a great moment. Let me transition quickly because I think one thing I want to show you is that religion is brought in, and this won't be a surprise to you either, but on, on let's say, the other side of the ledger, okay? Do anybody know? Who, well, I guess I wrote who this is. This is Scott Pruitt, our um, late, so to speak, EPA administrator. Um, and I wanted to show you guys a uh, uh, quick video. By the way, is the volume loud enough on the videos? We were having a whole back. Is it good? Okay. So let's see. Where is here's, here's uh, Scott Pruitt? And to your point, I think he he's on the on the other side, of sort of bringing in um, religious issues. Nature. The environmental left tells us that though, we've, though we have natural resources like natural gas and oil and coal, and though we can feed the world, we should do what? Keep those things in the ground, put up fences, and be about prohibition. That's wrong-headed, and I think, it's, I think it's counter to what we should be about. Pruitt believes God commands us to take care of the environment, and that also means to use what he has provided. The biblical worldview with respect to these, these issues is that we have a responsibility to, to manage and cultivate, harvest mm -hmm. uh, the natural resources that we've been blessed with uh, to, to, to truly bless our fellow mankind. As I only, so, it, by the way, this is an interview he did with the Christian Broadcasting Network. This is a time when the Trump administration officials weren't necessarily doing interviews with, let's say, mainstream press. They were doing interviews with sympathetic outlets. Um, I mean, I totally agree with you. From the little I know about other social justice movements, Religion is a crucial part of it. I mean, Martin Luther King, and so on. But um, just to give one example, but um, religion is also being kind of folded in here, um, uh, you know, to to prevent progress on policy on climate change. Um, I wanted to show one other video, and then I'll I'll take a couple more questions. Let's see. Here. Yes, okay, so this is another video of, I just want to prove to you that policymakers call on religion when stymieing, uh, thwarting, um, let's say, scientific progress. This is a, a, um, a compilation put together by something called Climate Desk. 22 that I use in there is as long as the earth remains there will be springtime harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night. My point is God's still up there. And this is the arrogance of people who think that we, human beings, would be able to change what he is doing in the climate is, to me, outrageous. The second verse comes from Matthew 24. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Uh, man will not destroy this earth. This earth will not be destroyed by a flood. Uh, two other issues, Mr. Chairman. Today we have about 388 parts per million in the atmosphere. I think in the age of the dinosaurs where we had most flora and fauna, we were probably at 4,000 parts per million. There is a theological debate that this is a carbon star planet. Uh, I would point out that if you're a believer in the Bible, the Texas uh, one would have to say the Great Flood is an example of climate change. And that certainly wasn't because mankind had overdeveloped uh, hydrocarbon energy. We were put on this earth as creatures of God to have dominion over the earth, to use it wisely and steward it wisely, but for our benefit, not for the earth's benefit. You heard him talk about dominion there, right? Um, uh, Rick Santorum, that was when he was running for president. Um, so did somebody else have a question at this point? Otherwise, I'm happy to keep. Yes, sir. Uh, Mine was just a super quick comment that both Pete Buttigieg and Catherine Hayhoe are going to be here in Austin this weekend at the Texas Tribune Festival. I heard just that, that, so that you know. uh, Pete was going to be. I didn't know Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg. Uh, I didn't know that Catherine Hayhoe would be. Maybe I should try to catch up with her. 
was just wondering if this um, pattern persists in other countries, if you've looked into that. Uh, it's a great question. I have no idea. Um, I don't know. Probably. Um, so, you know, there's some evidence that, um, so some of the most maybe outwardly religiously minded people um, are among the most skeptical about climate change. Um, there's a professor of religious studies at Texas A&M who has a, um, a book coming out in a couple months about the gospel, the gospel of climate skepticism. Um, and this is something she said in an interview. Um, her name's Robin Veldman. Uh, that drive for Christians to get out to vote, return to public life, and reclaim America. A lot of the people that I talk to believe that America used to be a Christian nation or should be a Christian nation. So they feel that becoming politically active is part of their mission to reclaim what was lost. So that all, you know, that figures into the Make America Great Again kind of moment, but, but that also dovetails with some of the pushback, let's call it, on science in my in my view, and based on the reporting and research that I've done. So this skepticism is growing. There's, there's, uh, Veldman shows that there's a 14% increase in you know, self-described skeptics among evangelicals um, during about a decade between 2006 and 2014. So what's happening during that period? Um, well, there's um, Al Gore wins the Nobel Prize. Um, and um, and then the, there's the and there's a lot of vitriol and pushback related to Al Gore winning that prize. Um, and then there's the tea, the growth of the Tea Party movement um, around the time of Obama's election. Um, and this is a picture from a rally here in Austin. Um, this is somebody who's pissed off about climate change, but pissed off that, that Congress might try to address it. Um, it's a slightly weird um, placard. Um, so I want to show a couple other things here. I mean, part of what's going on, of course, is where people get their information. This is at this same Tea Party rally. Thanks to Fox News, we're informed. Um, you know, there's a suggestion that newspapers like mine, the Austin American Statesman, lumbering mainstream media um, is papering over the real story. Um, and outlets like Fox News um, are, you know, become this echo chamber, this dependable source of information. And they're also, you know, um, uh, skewing um, rhetoric around issues of climate change and science um, or suppressing it. Um, so I... I'll, uh, did anybody have any questions? Um, I'm going to give a quick history lesson here. We're, we're, I have a few other things I want to show you. So this is back in the early 50s. This is J. Howard Pugh, the chairman of Sunoco. Maybe you've heard of the, um, the Pugh Trust, which does a lot of good work. But he, when he established these, he's a Christian conservative back in the 50s. He said this was, he wanted to establish these, this trust to acquaint the American people with the values of an open market, um, the dangers of inflation, the paralyzing effects of government controls on the lives and activities of people, and to promote the recognition of the interdependence of Christianity and freedom. Um, there's a new book that's come out called Anointed uh, with Oil by a professor at Notre Dame named Darren Dochuk, which is a lot about how everyone from wildcatters in, in Texas to uh, Rockefeller were trying to impose their own brand of Christianity on public policy and influence public opinion during the 20th century. Um, and so this is just one example of that. Um, so there's long been a nexus between um, energy profits and you know, a suggestion of freedom and, uh, and, and how to make sure that the government, you know, keeps its hand out of your pocketbook. Um, uh, and so one reason I mentioned this is that I wanted to kind of bring this up to speed. Here's a, here's a wind farm in, near Goldthwait. Um, I don't know, maybe that's 150 miles from here or so. Um, 
So this is a, a, a wind energy project that benefited from um, certain tax abatements. Um, and that these, I, I think you had the guy from the Texas Public Policy Foundation here recently who kind of addressed these. Um, so these tax abatements are enjoyed by a variety of industries. Um, but the Texas Public Policy Foundation this past legislative session um, kind of went after renewable energy uh, companies and tried to, tried to carve them out of this uh, subsidy. And, and I did a bunch of reporting about how the Texas Public Policy Foundation gets a lot of its money from fossil fuel companies. Um, and there's a reason I'm bringing all this up. So uh, um, the, the vice chair of the Texas Public Policy Foundation is a guy named Tim Dunn. I've heard one legislative aide to the former House Speaker describe him as a member of the Texas Taliban, um, which that's that person's opinion. But the point, his suggestion was that somebody with closely held religious views was influencing um, public policy. Um, so I have a video here of him done talking. Let's see. Here he is on a, this is on a, um, on a, this is in 2016, obviously it says that. This is on a kind of religious broadcasting network. Let's see if this works. Now, some of our listeners might say, well, the only perfect government we're going to get is when Jesus returns again and we have the, the new host. heaven and the new earth. But does the Bible maybe at least give us some inferences that make us uh, able to maybe judge government? Because right now you have some, well, Bernie Sanders, he says, you know, the solution is socialism. Everybody's mm -hmm. equal. Uh, and then you have Ted Cruz and others that are arguing, well, no, we think a free market makes much more sense and a republic. So how, how do we evaluate how, how do that evaluate biblically? That? Well, yeah. the, the real biblical approach to government is that, as you say, the ideal is a king with a perfect king, a kingdom with a perfect king. But pending that, yes, the ideal is a self-governing society. Right Now, this is... This is why America is exceptional. So we talk about America exceptionalism, and I hear people talk about it's exceptional for this or that. This is it. This is why we're exceptional. Exceptional doesn't necessarily mean better. Yes. It means different. Yes. Right? And I would say this is different and better. Right. But we are a self-governing organiza uh, organization. Now, how did, that, how did that come about? It came about because of the, of the biblical understanding. And... If you look at Romans 13, which is often cited, and it says God has granted the authority, so she should obey the authority. Here's the important question for all your listeners. Who is the appointed authority in America? Yeah, the voters. We the people. We the people. We the people. That's who he appointed the governing authority. So if you are an evangelical and you don't vote, yeah. And 39 million either did not vote or were not registered to vote in the last presidential election. That means you're, you are not doing your duty because you, you are the ones that God gave the authority to, and there's going to be a consequence for that. Um, I don't know if I said this. So Tim Dunn is the chairman of an oil and gas exploration firm in, based in Midland. Um, and... Uh, and so he, he's the vice chair also of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And over the last decade and a half, he's given about $10 million in campaign donations to Texas politicians um, and about $3 million to federal um, candidates, to candidates for federal office. And as I said, I, people can have whatever politically held views that they, religiously held views, politically held views they want, obviously. That's not for me to say. And people can give money as they want. But I'm just... I feel like part of my job as a reporter is to illuminate the, uh, as I said earlier, these connections between money and power and to give a sense of where the money's coming from, basically. Um, so uh, let's see. There was, I think, just one or two other quick things that I wanted to show you guys. Um, I mean, there, there are other ways this kind of nexus, as I put it, between energy and religion kind of materializes. There's the, um, there's the kind of um, green church movement. This is a 
church in Round Rock. It's a, quite a conservative church, True Life. I went up and interviewed the pastor. They put these solar panels on their roof. Partly is a matter of, just as a business matter, they think you know, they'll, it'll pay for itself over a dozen or so years. Um, and partly because it, it dovetails with uh, the kind of stewardship impulse that they have, that they, that they read into the Bible. And you have, I interviewed this pastor at another church in, in Cedar Park, and she talked to me a little bit about the tension she has presiding over a congregation in a suburban area where she's trying to get them to, you know, set aside their SUVs, and that leads to a little bit of friction. Uh, she says, I talked about SUVs, that got some people angry, but no one left over it. Um, and then I also interviewed a pastor of Stonegate Midland Church. This is a mega church out in Midland. And um, I asked him about this, this sort of dominionist versus stewardship issue. And he said, speaking of environmentalists broadly, people say, we're going to die here in 10 years if we continue to use fossil fuels. In the third world, they're going to die in 10 years if they don't use fossil fuels. His point is kind of energy poverty issue. And that as Christians, it's our duty um, to you know, export some of the industrial development that um, that we've benefited from here in the States. He said to me, the environmental movement demonizes anything they can demonize, but they can't carry a Nalgene bottle without petrochemicals. So I'm just gonna do one more slide here, just to show, actually two more, sorry. This just shows, this is just from earlier this week. Um, this is a tweet by an environmental attorney here in, in Texas. And I just wanted to show that these are very current um, kind of issues, the ones I've been talking about, going back to the 19th century and back to the 18th century and so on. Re-climate change. God created the world, including humanity, and he will end it on his terms as prophesied in the books of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation. Hashtag Holy Bible. Spoiler alert, it's rapture plus tribulation plus antichrist. Uh, world power and second coming and Armageddon, not carbon at Greta Thunberg. Um, you know, she's the, you guys know who she is, right? She's the activist. So, um, again, it's, Part of this, and you heard this in some of the video I showed earlier, is that it's presumptuous to think that humankind, we little humankind, can influence God's creation. Um, so there's this tension that continues to play out. Um, and then the kind of last thing that I would just point out, something that I've been grappling with, is um, are we influenced by our church? Does this matter? Do we go to whatever house of worship we go to because of whatever worldview we may have already? Um, in other words... In a way, has this whole conversation, this whole talk I've given, is it all phony? Um, do, we, do we go to a progressive synagogue or a progressive mosque because uh, we're progressive and that's why we go to it? Or do we go to it and then we're influenced by what the rabbi or the imam has to say? Or you know, vice versa, conservative-minded um, house of worship. And I think this question can be extended to all kinds of issues that we grapple with in contemporary society. So, um, you know, you have, just to be reductionist here, you have this evangelical movement. I mean, there, there's all kinds of dynamism within it, but you have a broad evangelical movement that's been hesitant on climate change. And is it, do people come to it because they already are hesitant on climate change for whatever reason, as well as hesitant about other kinds of social issues, as Sarah mentioned? Or um, are they influenced by the person in the pulpit? Um, that's, a, that's a whole other discussion. Um, I think that's, those are, that's, all, that's all my prepared remarks, so to speak. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, etc. Thanks for your patience. All right, see if anybody has any questions. Maybe we could take an informal poll. Nobody's being filmed here. Who, uh, on, on this, who thinks it is reasonable for, we'll just start with scientists instead of politicians, to invoke religion on scientific arguments, such as climate change? Raise your hand, and I'll just get an approximate percentage that using religion is a, is a good, is, is a worthwhile argument for 
science. All right, so we have, I would give it, uh, there are a lot of I would give it a 5%. Is it, is I would give it 5%. Below your shoulder, does it count? Is that? Uh, yeah, up? yeah, I think anything that looks like a hand raise in this case is going to count. That one counts, so I would give it to 5 or 10% range. Uh, what about a, polit a politician? A uh, politician to invoke religion on a scientific topic if they're discussing legislation that relates to scientific topic, let's just say cli climate change. I don't know. Uh, for a politician to do the same. Uh, I would give it, what's that? Uh, to use an argument as he's, as he's stated. Uh, uh, the Bible or a, a, a holy book or a scripture says this, therefore I interpret this as what I should do uh, in terms of agree, voting on legislation related to a scientific Right. Well, I'm just saying, yeah, whether that's a logical argument that you think is, or it's an argument that should be had, and whether it's different for scientists versus politicians. I was just curious. It looked roughly even, maybe a few more hands for a politician to do it, rather a scientist. But yeah, no, that's a good point. I think Dave has a. It's a good point. I mean, if I'm right, maybe people here are progressively minded. You're young, etc. You're knowledgeable. Um, not to say that, whatever. Um, you know, not to say that people can't be knowledgeable across the, the spectrum. But um, um, I think some people probably their their skin may crawl when they see some politicians talking about religion in the service of whatever their policy is. But then they think, yeah, no, it's quite sensible for political reasons when it's somebody who they agree with on on the policy. I was wondering if you had any insight into the people who have a stewardship-like point of view in that humans are put on Earth to preserve the environment, given that life has persisted for three-point-something billion years. How do they reconcile that we now need stewardship now when we didn't need it for three billion years? That's a great question. I, um, I don't know how they how they reconcile those things. I mean, um, I think there's a whole tightrope, which is something else I'm researching about how you reconcile the biblical view of Earth with the scientific, uh, the history of the, of the planet. And, um, and I think that also probably bleeds into some of these, kind of merges into some of these issues that I've been talking about here. Um, but I, I don't know for sure how they, how they marry those two. I wonder um, the percentage of young earth fundamental creationists versus old earth uh, theological. Yeah, I don't know how that breaks down. It's, a, it's also a good question. I mean, I think a lot of people take these kind of young earth things as a figuratively. They, they take the Bible figuratively. Um, I have religious people in my own family, religiously minded people who are also scientifically minded. And I think, partly, I don't necessarily speak that specifically about it with them um, for a variety of reasons, but, but my sense, or maybe I'd like to think that they, that they take parts of the Bible figuratively, so about the age of the planet. Um, so that's a way to hold both these things in your brain. Ashton. Yes. So um, I grew up around sort of two very sort of like radical different groups. I grew up around people who were extremely religious and as well as those who were very not. And one of the things that I, real, that I sort of noticed was the very religious people, one of their things was sort of like the faith without proof, the unquestioning, sort of like the following versus the other group, their whole thing was question and ask and try and figure out why. And I, do you think there's a difference in sort of how you're raised with being sort of the faith without proof and like sort of take things as as you see them versus the really the investigation side you think that has anything to do with how people sort of interpret religious religion and sort of like environmental issues yeah i'm sure it does and actually i think it goes to the, to the kind of question i've posed here which is that i think people come to whatever held beliefs they have for all kinds of reasons, socioeconomic and environmental reasons, that is the environment in which they grew up, um, 
so uh, um, I think that I think those kinds of things are a hugely important factor in in how you approach even as you might be religious how you approach uh, from a religious perspective these kinds of questions that um, you know we're always grappling with hi um, hello my name's Peyton um, Aiden hi yes uh, how do you think like, what do you think is going to be happening in the future with, like, this kind of realm of uh, religion and politics? Do you, like, what issues do you see coming up more? Um, do you think people are going to gradually move away from religion, or do you think some people are going to, like, see that? In, like... That's a great question. Um, May I ask one? Just yes. follow-up. It's maybe the same thing, just to state more clearly something. Since you're writing a book on well, you study politics and writing a book on energy and religion. Do you see religion being invoked more or less over time, 10 years, 100 years? I don't know, depending on how much you've been thinking about it. I was looking at my crystal ball at 100 years down the line. Um, in, in, the, in the past, has it, oh, do you oh, think oh. it's been trending more for people to use a religious argument for? It comes in waves. Or less. Actually, um, it comes in waves depending on things like on what kind of anxiety the country is in. Um, we, we tend to... We tend to be more religiously minded as an American people during more anxious periods, um, but we're we're such a religious country. I mean, you heard Tim Dunn talking about exceptionalism, and I think one of the ways we're exceptional um, is in terms of our religiosity. I mean, okay, there are lots of there are lots of countries that have religious law as part of their is, is you know as part of their makeup. Um, uh, I also think, to your question, Aiden, I think that, you know, just as the, the country has grown more and more polarized about all sorts of things, the role of religion in public life will be just another thing that people are, and we've seen this, our people are up in arms about. You, you have um, people who want to stamp it out altogether, the idea of religion in public life, and then you have people who... Um, who think we're becoming a, you know, a leftist communist society, uh, in that, you know, that, think of the think of the woman in Kentucky who refused to um, uh, issue marriage licenses, right, to to uh, to gay applicants. Um, um, you know, some people held her up as a hero, um, and and were infuriated that courts required her to. To, to issue those licenses. Um, uh, and other people thought it was, that she was insane. I mean, the, the, the idea that somebody, based on her personal religious beliefs, couldn't, as a public servant, uh, issue those licenses, uh, they thought that was, to them, it, it confirmed every stereotype about kind of a, a certain backwards way of folding in religion in public life. So, I don't think it's it's going away. I think it's it's a part of what draws me to this topic is that it's it's a function of the greater political landscape in our country right now. You guys in the middle. Yeah. Wait for the thing. What? Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a, a comment that it's really cool that you are. Um, observing the intersection between, um, you know, environmentalism and religion, because I feel like we, we kind of need more of that. What's the other, what does this group of people think, and what, what does this group of people think? And I feel like sometimes we need more people talking across uh, purposes like that. So I just wanted to comment that I think it's really cool that you're Thank investigating you. this. I want to um, take you with me wherever I go, and yeah. you can just <laughs> broadcast yeah. that. Well, I appreciate it. You can, when the, whenever the book comes out you can blurb it yeah can... yeah I'm actually I'm personally interested in this subject too like how do we speak other people's languages because like you were saying sometimes uh, uh, certain ways of saying things puts people off um, so oh, yeah. it's like really fascinating to me well, I think I mean there's a whole there's a whole realm of there's a whole other conversation we could have about because right we we're in our different echo chambers as I alluded to so it's it's unusual to have people 
uh, congregate, yeah. so to speak, to talk about an issue that they might not be like-minded about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, thank you. Uh, we need more Renaissance people. <laughs> I appreciate it. And what's your name? David. David, thanks. I noticed that a lot of the religious figures that you were showing in the videos, they were making the argument that we humans aren't going to be the ones to destroy the earth. And that seems to me that they're countering an argument that climate scientists aren't making that climate change will destroy the earth. Uh, yeah, I think, let's see. Right, so you're, right, so you're saying, they say we the humans aren't going to destroy the earth, and then what was the second part of your point, David? I don't think anybody's claiming that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to destroy the earth. No, I mean, well, I think people worry about the long-term consequences of a changing climate on various kinds of species, whether, you know, what, to what extent it will lead to further flooding. I mean, if you mean, will it destroy the actual planet, uh, you know, the planet's not going to explode um, because there's carbon in the atmosphere. Um, but I think that that's what they're, uh, I mean, I think that's what they're pushing back against, though, is not, I don't think they're suggesting the world is going to, is going to um, explode. I mean, it, eventually we're going to be engulfed by the exploding sun and we'll be, our planet will be obliterated in billions of years, but that's a whole other thing. Um, I think they're pushing back against the suggestion that uh, carbon emissions, you know, from industrial activity influences the, ap influences the atmosphere in, in such a way that leads to, you know, species extinction or, or flooding or myriad other things. They think it's presumptuous that, they're not basing their arguments on science, but they think it's presumptuous that humans can, can affect the, the climate that way. Does that make sense? That's my understanding. We have time for, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to keep chatting. I just want to. We'll go for, I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 leave you I'll follow up on one. Side. We'll go for one more question in the front, and of course we can By hang way, out I'm later. By the way, I'm not a climate scientist. Yeah. That so may be, is obviously. I, a I, I take the previous question as more um, an argument, is essentially hyperbole. I'm going to throw out this thing that's so extreme, like only God can destroy the earth, uh, oh. to as an argument against climate change being a thing when, mitigation effects or whatever scientists are saying about climate change isn't about destroying the earth. I so they've gone to this extreme argument to say, you can't possibly destroy the earth, and nobody's even having an argument about I destroying see. the earth. I, I so is this, you know, I think that's how, a, I, how do you, right. how do you okay. take, take that point. in your book? I yeah. take your point. No, I, I take that. Uh, thanks, David and Kerry. I, uh, yeah, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a rhetorical political argument, right? They're, 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 uh, it's a straw man, the, you know. Uh, so, it's a, it's a good thought. Thank you. I, I just was thinking as he was talking about perhaps the difference between the religious stewardship versus dominionist camp is built into the theology. Like I know a lot of the the stewardess or uh, the uh, uh, steward people are more p potentially Arminianist. Is that the word versus Calvinist? Is this true? Like yeah. Maybe the dominion is like God ordained. He's controlled. Right. Perhaps that evangelical side. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. yeah no, that's right. There's there 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 are different historical uh, strains of religious thought within Christian denominations that involve, um, you know, and this gets at things like prosperity gospel and uh, and so it, um, there's a there's and I. I want to make sure that I'm not suggesting, you know, groups are monolithic here. I mean, there's a, there's a diversity of thought, even, of course, within single churches. Um, but I'll give you another example of how, though, there's a kind of intersection between people's politics, their occupation, their church. The, pres the, the United Presbyterians uh, were going to vote uh, a couple years ago on a resolution about divesting um, from fossil fuel uh, companies. The, the Presbyterians apparently have stock in, in fossil fuel companies. And the diocese in Houston and Dallas tried to influential members who were involved in the oil and gas industry. I, again, I don't, 
begrudge them that. I'm just reporting that that was um, that was the uh, that was the politics of it within the Presbyterian Church. Okay, let's thank Asher for a good talk, and maybe we can continue the discussion at a local watering hole if he was inclined. But let's thank him again for a great talk and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the great questions.